In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. It's a pleasure to be with you here today uh, on a fine, cold winter day. And uh, Chris, uh, well, you tell us about the weather. <laughs> it's delightful. It started last night, just a light dusting. So it was, it was great to see all the snow falling down. So this snow is, has finally arrived in Chicagoland. And it's stuck. It's not a lot of it, but it's, true. it's definitely coating the atmosphere. It's fantastic. And for those that are longtime listeners, they know that Chris just loves the winter. It's it his favorite uh, time of year. Yeah, I we've had the cold this week, and now we have the snow as well. So it's fantastic. I will take cold and snow yeah. up through, I would say, about mid-January. By that mid-January. time, I want spring to arrive. So. <laughs> Let's just say through February, yeah. You don't have a whole another month and a half to go. Yeah, I know. And then I'll put some... a hot cocoa in your hand. We'll, we'll say you over. Yeah, yeah right, right. <laughs> So yes, winter has arrived here in Chicagoland. It's it's very nice. It's dirt nice during the Christmas season. Mm. So I know uh, you are very pleased uh, with it. So Indeed. it was quite warm and mild in November. So it's it was. I think even last week on the weekend, like we've had thirty and twenty, but yeah. Sunday Monday was sixty degrees. Mm. It was like a nice little overture to fall yes. before it finally left our presence. Right, right. Yeah. Nice. Um, all right. Well, so before um, on, on today's show, we're going to be talking about uh, getting the Reformation wrong, and uh, we'll be talking about the Protestant Reformation and some um, perhaps misconceptions that we might have about it. Um, before we get into that discussion, though, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, I know that speaking of the Christmas spirit, uh, last week I forgot to mention, if you look behind me here, uh, you can see uh, I've strung some nice, fine, colored Christmas lights over the uh, Veracity Hill uh, television there. So if you had a keen eye, you would have spotted those last week. We will keep those up, of course, through the holiday season. Uh, just something a little festive, I think, that we can uh, do here in the office. <laughs> we haven't said of anything else. <laughs> so uh, That's right. Uh, so, okay, uh, also, uh, Veracity Hill has been doing this uh, fundraiser. It's been an ongoing fundraiser. It was, uh, <laughs> it started back in September, I think, and we had planned to do a two-month fundraiser. Yes. But then Hurricane Harvey hit Texas. Uh, we were fundraising for um, someone else, I think, had some health problems. I recommended that we go and support them. Yes. Then we had our conference coming up, and it we was... We did, and before the conference, we had some web errors as well. Ah, yeah. yes. So... Yeah. Right. So we've been. It's been an extended two months. It's been a lot months. of hurdles thrown up in a way. Nevertheless, just for three more weeks, I will be requesting your money here before the end of the year, mm. and uh, would love to get your support. Uh, there are a couple ways you can do that. You can. Um, uh, the, the best way is to go online to the website veracityhill.com/patron. I've also included a dash give there, um, and if you become one of our monthly supporters at twenty dollars a month, we will send you this nifty USB flash drive. And uh, it, uh, it has the USB side there, the, uh, the, the regular USB, and for integrating and moving into the future, the USB-C, which can plug into different smartphones, Android. Uh, Joe, the guy that works behind us, he had an Android, and this would plug in right to his phone. Yeah. And also, I know, for newer iPhones. So you can plug this right in and listen to episodes uh, that we have preloaded on this flash drive. So we'd love to get your support. And you can go to the website to learn more about that. And, of course, if you've got any questions, just send me an email, kurt at veracityhill.com. And it's worth mentioning, Kurt, that uh, I think we mentioned at the end of every show, everything that we do here is funded completely from the generosity of patrons and people who believe in the work that we're doing. Yep, yep, that's right. So you help us make this happen. And if you want our our podcast ministry to grow here, uh, we need your support. And we are growing. Um, it's, it, 2017 has seen good growth, especially with the live stream uh, that we've been doing on Facebook. We're able to uh, advertise that. And so we can, we can reach 2,000 people with just 10 to $15. Uh, so with your help, we can be getting the, the show uh, in front of numerous different eyeballs and ears and uh, helping them to see uh, what a great program we have here on the variety of topics also from a variety of perspectives. 
so getting Christians to think well about different issues, to gr- go outside their comfort zones, uh, and to learn to engage with one another and to discuss civilly, uh, you know, conversations that might otherwise be uncomfortable. So I'll have those uncomfortable conversations for you, I guess, in the meantime. <laughs> Good. All right. So um, today's program, we are uh, blessed to be joined uh, with Dr. Jim Payton. He uh, spoke at our conference a few weeks ago. He is the author of Getting the Reformation Wrong, Correcting Some Misunderstandings. And uh, Jim, thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Yeah, it's a privilege to be on. Thank you, Kurt. Great. Okay, so um, before I get into asking you some questions about misconceptions that we might have, let me first ask you this, uh, we'll call it a baseline question. So could you tell us what do uh, most people, most Protestants, think about the Reformation, generally speaking? Well, to the degree we think about it, um, we think of it as as a renewal movement. Uh, sometimes people almost act as if nothing had happened between the time the apostles died and the reformers <laughs> came along. That's certainly not accurate, but that's kind of the gut hunch that some people seem to operate from. Yeah. We think about the Reformation, we're positive on it, we're grateful for it, we think of it as a reaction, obviously, to the problems that had developed. Mm. But along the way, uh, some of the notions that have developed among us or become common uh, in, uh, have be, have problems with them, uh, show some misunderstanding of, of what actually took place during the Reformation. Mm-hmm. And that's why I wrote the book. Yeah, yeah great, great. Yeah, that's I, I like what you said there, that for, for many people, uh, you know, <laughs> there is no time development. Uh, there's no time gap between when the, the New Testament was written and the Reformation era. It's just complete consistency, and uh, the, the history is a little muddier than that, and so I'm glad that you're here to guide us through some of those muddy waters. Uh, and also, before I forget, too, so we've got um, your book here, and we're going to be giving it away uh, today. So, for those that are following along on the live stream, all you have to do is share the live stream video with your friends on Facebook. And that will be enough to enter you to win this book right here. This very copy. We've got a few uh, back in the, the storage closet. But I'll send you this one right here. So if you want a copy of uh, Jim's book, we would be glad to send it your way. All you have to do is share this video with your friend, and, with your friends on Facebook. And we'll uh, get in touch with the random winner that we select after today's program. So, okay. So we've got... Um, uh, history that we have to look at. You are, uh, uh, you have been a career-long historian, uh, looking at uh, different issues uh, in uh, church history and theology. And so, um, first, I want to ask you this: give us a little bit of context, if you would, as to what led us to the Reformation. Right? It didn't just happen, you know, in a vacuum. It happened behind cultural backgrounds political issues and and the like there's a context to the events so tell us about the uh, the pre-reformation era well after the collapse of the roman empire in the west in the 400s uh, there was a slow christianization evangelization of europe that led also to trying to establish christian mores and in government and practices in society and that seemed to go pretty well through about the uh, the 12th century, the 13th through the 13th century, the 1200s. And people were positive on it. Uh, the, and we should we should note that nations had not really been established in a way that we would recognize them today as we mm. would with Canada mm. or Britain or France. Uh, they were emerging from you know tribal loyalties and local re- local realities. So the only international association was the church, which was headquartered in Rome in the West. Mm. And so in, in so many ways, uh, people looked to Rome for guidance, not not only because it, it, it had contact everywhere, but also because through the church and through the teaching of the uh, of missionaries and, and the establishment of churches and, uh, throughout Europe, uh, people had been brought into the faith and looked to the church for guidance. So things were going well through the 13th century, but beginning in the last two centuries of what we call the medieval period, the 14th and 15th centuries, was, there was a succession of horrendous events that happened. First was uh, some real agricultural problems with bad weather, bad, bad harvests, and since people were dependent 
on the harvest for the seed for the next year, that was a problem. Uh, some famine set in. There was there was there was bad weather that contributed to this. Mm. About the same time, the Black Death came along, the bubonic plague. People had no idea what was causing it, uh, but it just would erupt, and in huge swaths of people would die in regions, um, and, and it was terrifying. Mm. Um, and so when people looked legitimately to the church for answers, the church didn't have good answers. In fact, some of the times, the priests were the ones who were fleeing uh, <laughs> from the areas of contagion. Mm. So that didn't give much confidence. So that, that was kind of background. In addition to that, you had um, a, a lot of warfare and result, re, revolts, not just the Hundred Years' War between England and France, but many other local skirmishes where people who claimed to be Christian were fighting with each other over whatever topic. Mm. There was problems with, as well with the government of the church. The leadership became corrupted. Um, there was the, a time when the, the leadership of the church no longer was in Rome. It went to Avignon and was known to be a very corrupt corrupt. Uh, area of practice uh, mm -hmm. for the church. Uh, then there was a time where there were two and then eventually three popes. Uh, and, and what ended up happening by the 1400s is that a lot of people had lost confidence in the church. The kind of confidence had been available a couple of hundred years before. Mm. And there were, it, problems, there it, were problems in teaching, the, mm. the development of schooling, uh, in, in scholastic, the development of schooling in, in the universities ended up emphasizing a lot uh, the emphasis on logic and reason, uh, depending on the works of Aristotle, have been rediscovered. But eventually then, in theology, what ended up happening is that the, the theology was mostly argument. Uh, they delighted in having debates and arguing with each other in, in, about abstruse topics that had relatively little relevance to the way people were actually living. Mm. And so there were, there were a whole host of things that were happening. There was a, re a greater recognition as well that, that the leadership of the church, not only in, in Rome, but also locally, was not living up to its obligations, uh, to what they professed. Mm. It was quite a bit of, of anti-clericalism, hostility toward uh, clergy uh, as kind of an attitude, kind of a default position, if you will, kind of the way a lot of North Americans now look at politicians. Um, just not trusting them to do what they say they're going to do. And, and that, when, when the church is the only kind of coherent bond holding everything together, uh, that's a real problem. Uh, along the way, nations were, becoming, were being established, though, and, and so some loyalty was being shifted from this international body, if we could call it that, of Rome, to what could be found in, in being well-governed by a French king or a Spanish king or the German emperor or whatever. So there was a lot of upheaval going on, and, and and in that upheaval there was a lot of argument about what the Christian faith is about, you know, how to understand it, how to practice it. Mm. So what ended up happening with Reformation was not that new ideas were, new questions were raised, but the different ideas were given as answers. And so the, the Reformation didn't drop out of the sky, uh, out of heaven from God. It happened <laughs> on the ground as people found different ways of, of wrestling with and responding to issues that people have been raising for a couple of hundred years. Mm. So for, for 200 years, by the time the Reformation broke out, there was a call for Reformation from head to toe, to straighten things out from, from you know, in Latin it's Reformatio incapite et membris, you know, from, from head to toe, straighten things out. And finally it started to happen. Yeah, yeah. So like you said, issues in theology, um, you know, the practical application thereof, uh, in, the, in the lifestyle of the clergy, uh, the, uh, the ownership of land and the taxing of people by the church. Uh, mm -hmm. th these are ideas which to the, uh, the uh, un unlearned mind here in our 21st century, I mean, it's like, wait a second, churches taxed people? I mean, you know, it's just, it's a very foreign concept to us. And so when yep. we can go back and study the history, uh, we could see what those uh, reasons uh, were for bringing about uh, the 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 good of the Reformation. Um, so let me ask you this: uh, I know in my experience, um, some people, uh, pastors or people in ministry that are, uh, especially those that tend to be Reformed, uh, capital R, uh, often contrast the Reformation with the Renaissance. Um, so could you tell us first uh, what 
what was the Renaissance and uh, why uh, maybe should we not be so, uh, uh, so against it? Okay. The Renaissance was an attempt that developed first in Italy before it broke out in, in Northern Europe. It, it, was a, it was an attempt to reinvigorate Italian society, but it, the way they did it was by going back to the, the original sources of, of the Greeks and the Romans, looking to them as, as a better period than this intervening century since the collapse of, of Rome, of the Roman Empire. And so the, the Renaissance was an attempt to give a, a, a new form of education uh, rather than scholastic theology or, or the, the kind of learning that had developed during the Middle Ages to go back to, uh, the, the, to what was the practices of, of training people for service in society and in the church in, in the ancient period. Uh, what ended up happening is that uh, the, the first real book that was written about the, ref, uh, about the Renaissance – to interpret it for us in the West was was by uh, a man named Jacob Burckhardt, who wrote the uh, Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy. He wrote it in 1860, and he it was a brilliant essay, a, a lengthy and very influential document, in which he pointed out that the the, the, uh, it, the Italians who emphasized this return to the ancient sources called themselves humanist or humanista, which is Italian at the time for human or for humanists. Or. Well, what ended up happening though is that in the 19th century, when this book was written, uh, humanism was a philosophical orientation that, that man is the center of all things, basically excluding God. Um, and what ended up being understood by some people, though it wasn't what Burkhardt himself said, is that the Renaissance was kind of a man-centered, man-centered movement, and that set it up nicely for, in some people's minds for the contrast with the God-centered ref- movement of the Reformation. Mm. The interesting thing, though, is that when people actually started to go beyond, go to do research into what humanist meant uh, in during the Renaissance, is they could not find that philosophical orientation. Rather, humanist meant a teacher of the humanities, somebody who teaches math, physics, history, science, as we would say it in, the, in present day languages. Yeah. And it didn't have a philosophical focus; it had a pedagogical focus. Mm. So that this contrast of the Renaissance being man-centered was was a misunderstanding. Um, The the Renaissance was an attempt to find a better way of training people to live in God's society, the the Christian society of Europe, um, but to to do so in a way that wasn't all just focused on logic. Um, The the interesting thing about this is that this man-centered Renaissance versus God-centered Reformation approach did become common, has been heard, and as I indicate in one of the chapters in the book, uh, has become a fairly common trope in a lot of, uh, of Protestant circles. But what actually is the case is that when the, the reformers themselves, aside from Martin Luther, all of them were trained in the North in the, the version of the, uh, of the Renaissance that took root in the North, which was studying the ancient Greeks and Romans, but especially studying the church fathers and studying the scriptures and the early church. And all the reformers except Luther, so this would include Philip Melanchthon, John Calvin, Martin Bucer, Ulrich Swingley, and all the, all the others whose names we don't know as well, all of them were steeped in this, uh, in this uh, northern Renaissance tradition of what was called the northern Christian humanist movement, largely led by Erasmus, and none of them ever repudiated the movement when they came to the Reformation. As a matter mm. of fact, what they did instead is they continued to pledge, you know, basically to indicate their allegiance to and respect for, for Erasmus even to and beyond his death in 1536. And when they ended up setting up schools that were the main way in which, or one of the main ways in which the Reformation could be could be defended and propagated for tu- future generations, every one of them ended up setting up according to a northern Christian humanist educational program. So that Rather than being a foe of the Re- of the Reformation, the Renaissance was a friend to it. It it, it offered the materials the reformers used. The Erasmus produced the Greek New Testament, the first critical edition. Yeah. Uh, he and and others, including Protestant reformers, ended up as you know editing and publishing the works of the Church Fathers uh, to enable people to get back and study uh, what the early Church had said, not just what the medieval uh, teaching had, had that had developed in scholastic times were. So the Renaissance was really uh, a, a friend to the Reformation. 
and mm. it served well. And scholarship has really destroyed the notion that the Renaissance was a, in opposition to the Reformation or a contrary movement. Yeah, so so on uh, last week's episode, we were uh, speaking with uh, uh, Dr. Um, Augustine Cassidy, and um, we were talking about how uh, oftentimes some people want to think very simply in either or uh, mentality, either this or that. So in our context last week, it was you were either, some people mistakenly believed, you were either an Augustinian or you were a Pelagian. Uh, and so in this context here, it seems that we also find this where people want to think in just simple two, two labeled categories, you know, Renaissance or Reformation, when, when really the Renaissance, as you said, was a friend and was beneficial to uh, the Reformation. Uh, and, it, and it strikes me that um, a, uh, one of the Reformation terms might even apply to both movements, the ad fontis, um, getting to the source. Of course, for the Reformation, the source being the Bible, the Renaissance, though the source might be something else in their context, um, get, getting back to the way that Christians ought to function in a society, something like that. Um, yeah, so that's, true. that's great. That's great. Okay, um, now uh, the next question I have for you is regarding uh, sola fide uh, and uh, what, what that phrase means, uh, how people usually understand it, and maybe how they might be mistaken on what the reformers meant. Please uh, enlighten us. Okay. The Reformation is basically most known probably, as far as slogans go, for the sola fide one, by faith alone. That we are justified. We are accounted righteous with, before God by faith alone. And so that's what sola fide means in Latin. Um, the way that's the reformers all ended up emphasizing that, whether it was Luther or Melanchthon or Calvin or Swingley or, or any of the others, uh, other major reformers, they all ended up emphasizing that as over against what had developed in a lot of people's understanding at the time uh, and was taught to some degree within the, the late medieval church that in addition to believing you had to do this or that or the other, you had to do a certain amount of good works, whatever it would be, and that would add to your accepting acceptance before God. You would earn merit, and that it was only through that pile of additional things you would do that you could be accepted or justified before God. Reformers ended up arguing, no, that, we're, that we are accepted before God by faith alone, not by all the things we do. However, by our time, and I've heard this often said in evangelical churches or fundamentalist churches, various types of conservative churches, it almost sounds the way a lot of people talk about justification by faith alone as that faith remains can remain alone. For the Reformers, justification is by faith alone, but faith is never alone. Mm. They stress repeatedly that a true faith that brings us peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ will lead us inevitably to serve God, to seek to walk before him, to be faithful to him, to love God and our neighbors. So that while we're justified by faith alone, faith is never alone. Faith is always accompanied by works of love and service and devotion. We're not perfect. We're not going to be accepted by God for them. We don't have to try to get, try to work hard so that God will like us better mm. by, by things we do. Uh, he already has loved us in Jesus Christ, and we can find peace with God uh, through faith uh, in Christ alone. But that faith in which we find that peace with God doesn't remain solitary. So that the idea that, that sometimes I've, I've heard, perhaps you've run into this as well, of, of a carnal Christian or somebody who walked an aisle at, at some kind of evangelistic rally and prayed the sinner's prayer right. and some, that somehow has eternal security, once saved, always safe, yep. and that's the last kind of time he's tipped his hat toward God, but God's stuck with him forever now that he you know, said the 10 seconds of the, of the <laughs> prayer. Yeah. The reformers would find that utterly absurd mm. uh, because every one of them emphasized that, that while we are justified by faith alone, we, we can find genuine peace with God, that peace with God leads us to serve him, not to neglect him. Mm. And that discipleship and devotion and turning toward him is not an option, but it's our call. And we don't do it perfectly. We're going to continue to, to fail, we'll continue to need to repent of sin and our failures and learn to love God more faithfully. But none of that's an option. Mm. You know, that's simply the way faith lives. Yeah. And so solitary faith for the reformers would be an abomination. 
And to the degree to which we've, in some conservative Christian circles, have stepped in that direction, we've definitely turned away from not only the Reformers, but what the New Testament teaches as well. Yeah, I could certainly think how um, evangelistic crusades, for example, Billy Graham crusades being the most famous of the, the 20th century, um, are a good starting point for getting people to accept the gospel message. But if, if, if we just leave it at that, as you mentioned, if, if it's just faith on its own, lonely, <laughs> um, that, that's not a good thing. And so part of our task uh, as Christians uh, is to disciple people, um, right? The Great Commission is to go and make disciples. Uh, it's not necessarily to tell everybody that you can about the gospel, but it's about having them become real followers of Jesus. And so that's maybe where the, the task after the crusade, the evangelistic crusade, begins. So you want to meet with people that have recently given their life to Christ. Don't just give up on those people. I mean, there are people in my life that I know, um, you know, have, have sort of done that. They think, you know, like you said, Jim, that they've just said this prayer and they're, they're set to go. Maybe they go to church on Christmas and Easter uh, <laughs> um, and that, that God would, you know, perhaps still like them. That was maybe some of the pushback that the reformers had against the the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, insofar as uh, there was uncertainty about one's salvation because they had to um, not not just have faith but also work. It was a combination of both in order to be saved. Is that an accurate description of the reformers' position? Yeah, they were. They Luther, for example, uh, who was the first one to articulate this so vigorously was somebody who had sought through the means the church had laid out, through fasting and penance and doing good works, to find peace with God. And he found it, it just didn't work. Mm. And it, that was part of what drove him and, and, uh, and others as well, to find this peace with God that we can have through, uh, through believing in Christ and relying on him rather than ourselves. But I think the point you made is very good. But, you know, the, the, the Great Commission doesn't say go and make converts of all nations go and make disciples of all nations, and that means beyond the time of a person making a profession of faith, and however that would be done, whether in sinner's prayer or some other fashion, mm. it's an ongoing, lifelong growth in and encouragement to walk in the ways of the Lord. Yeah. Yep. And that's that, what reformers were after. Yep. That's great. Well, we've got to take a short break here. Uh, before we go to break, I see we've uh, got Blaine here who has asked a question on the live stream uh, Blaine, we will get to your question uh, in the second half of today's show. And uh, before we take the break, let me remind you to take this opportunity. If you would like to have Dr. Jim Payton's book here, Getting the Reformation Wrong, uh, please share this uh, video live stream that you might be watching, and you are immediately entered to win. We will pick a random winner uh, at the end of uh, today's show. And so uh, we'd, we'd love to get your support just through sharing this video and telling people about today's episode. All right, stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Have you heard of the Google Ad Grant for nonprofits? 501c3 nonprofit organizations can receive $10,000 per month in online advertising credit from Google empowering you to share your message with the world. At Defenders Media, we partnered with Nonprofit Megaphone, an agency focused solely on Google grant acquisition and management. They got us approved for the grant and now manage ad campaigns, bringing hundreds of new people to our websites each month. If you are eligible, Nonprofit Megaphone will acquire and manage the grant for you for a month for free to see if they can help you too. Visit nonprofitmegaphone.com to learn more. Hello, I'm David Smith, the Executive Director of Illinois Family Institute, a state-based Christian pro-life and pro-family public policy organization. I want to invite you 
to join us as we seek to be salt and light to a dark and rapidly decaying culture. You can do that in a number of ways. For example, you can join our email list to get timely alerts and great cultural commentaries. You can like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, listen to our podcasts, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can attend one or more of the special events and forums we host in different parts of the state. We do all these things to encourage and equip Christians in Illinois. You see, we need you to help us fulfill our mission to boldly bring a biblical perspective to public policy. Our faith requires us to be bold, speak truthfully, and love our neighbors. Join us. Visit IllinoisFamily.org to learn more. All right, thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. Uh, I am very honored uh, to be joined here uh, on today's program by Dr. Uh, Jim Payton. Uh, he is a, a highly respected uh, church historian and scholar, and he's written numerous different books. Uh, we're talking about one of those books today and the, the topic and the themes therein, uh, Getting the Reformation Wrong. And uh, before we get into that discussion, though, uh, I do want to uh, uh, welcome Jim to a round of rapid questions where we've got 60 seconds and we're going to ask you some of these, uh, you know, goofy sort of questions. Most uh, regular listeners already know what they are, but for first time guests like yourself, uh, you don't quite know what's going to be coming your way. So we're going to start the game clock here and um, um, again, 60 seconds and we'll try to see how many you can get. So uh, Jim, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, here we go. What is your clothing store of choice? Clothing store of choice. Um, more, Moore's. Taco Bell or KFC? Taco Bell. Where would you like to live? Where I'm living, in Hamilton, Ontario. <laughs> What's your favorite sport? Um, soccer. What fruit would you say your head is shaped like? <laughs> <laughs> Melon, I guess. Okay, what's uh, your favorite movie? Um, where Eagles Dare. Do you drink Dr. Pepper? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Have you ever driven on the other <laughs> side of the road? <laughs> Pardon? Have you ever driven on the other side of the road? Uh, no. Uh, what's one thing you'd be sure to keep with you if you were stranded on an island? I don't know. Um, stranded on an island. Um, my wife. <laughs> Good, nice. Uh, the Hokey Pokey electric slide or the Macarena? Hokey Pokey. The Hokey Pokey. All right. <laughs> Jim, thank you for playing that round of rapid questions. Okay. I think you've given, um, I wouldn't say the most humorous answer for the uh, Stranded Island question, but you've given probably the one of the best for someone who's <laughs> married. <laughs> Having the company, of course, we've had we've had uh, traditional ones. Uh, you know, someone to keep a Bible with them, or um, we did. <laughs> it, was this a month or so ago now, Chris? Uh, with with Tim Shaw, yeah. um, we did an episode on um, the gun control bait, debate, and um, and the uh, in, interviewer interviewee uh, was an advocate for gun uh, for gun ownership. So his answer to the uh, Stranded Island question was he would keep his gun with him because he could hunt with it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that one, I think, caught me most off guard. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, all right. So uh, before we get into the, um, the discussion again, let me say this. Here, here's an article that I'm reading uh, thanks to my wife uh, sharing this article with me. Uh, so uh, this comes from Inc.com. Why you should surround yourself with more books then you'll ever have time to read. Uh, an overstuffed bookcase or e-reader says things about your mind that you love to learn. Uh, interestingly enough that you're intellectually humble because you realize how much you don't know. And having those books around, what they call an anti-library, is actually beneficial for your, for your health and well-being. Uh, so for those that fear that they have too many books, fear not. Uh, even uh, my wife, Michaela, wrote here, she posted this on my personal uh profile. This will make you very, very happy and more smug than I'll probably like. <laughs> so good benefits. Jim, I'm sure you're someone like myself that has more books than what I can read. Um, yes. So, but that, 
apparently that is a good thing. Uh, it's a, it, it leads to having good health and a good state of mind. So having an anti-library, as they say, is good. So I'll be sure to share that article um, on the Veracity Hill social media just for people that might be interested. So if you wanted to, to read that article, I will be sure to share that after today's episode. Okay, so we are uh, talking about the, the Reformation and the ideas behind it and perhaps some um, misconceptions that we might have about it. And I've got a few more questions for you, Jim, and then we'll be able to get to Blaine's question, which, uh, Blaine, if, assuming you're still watching, that's a very good question, and Jim is an excellent person to answer that. So uh, before we get to your question, though, so Jim, uh, before the break, we talked about sola fide, and I'm wondering now if you could talk about the, uh, the phrase sola gratia, uh, or, or, or gratia, depending upon how one pronounces it, um, and what that idea was, um, uh, and how we might have some misunderstandings about that phrase. The sola gratia means by grace alone, that it's by, entirely by God's work uh, and, and mercy toward us, and by, by his grace, that we can find peace with God and so on. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't have any responsibilities. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be diligent about prayer or reading scripture or serving others or walking in God's ways. Uh, but sola gratia indicates that what brings us to peace with God, what gives us uh, that, that sense of the assurance that God does love us in Jesus Christ, uh, is the grace that he has shown toward us in Christ, and not what we have accomplished of good works or other kinds of things that would try to commend ourselves to him by. Okay. That's a great clarification there of uh, that, that term. I know in... Um, <laughs> in, in my field of interest and the conversations I like to have with people, um, that certainly can come out that um, the human role uh, is limited or passive uh, when, the, when the, the fact of the matter seems to be, no, that we still have a strong active role to play here. Um, and I think it might play into uh, also what you talked about before the break, that for some people it's, you know, as long as they said that prayer, they're, they're good to go. Um, and uh, they don't have to do anything else. But uh, it's clear that the scripture teaches us to have an active uh, spiritual life, to be constantly growing and walking with the Lord, and uh, to think that it's, it's exclusively uh, on God at the expense of the human role to play. Uh, that, that's a, that's um, uh, a misstep, a misconception that we might have. Uh, so the Reformation was... was chock full of controversy, um, um, fake kidnappings, uh, <laughs> um, a lot of drama, uh, stress for, for people, for the reformers, for their supporters. Um, and some of that was because of the concern of what the Roman Catholic Church would do. Uh, what was Rome's response to the Reformation? A couple different things. Um we, we, we've gotten used to talking about the Counter-Reformation as if that was the whole story. And certainly there was a vigorous reaction if, beginning in the 1530s to what had happened with the Reformers. In fairness, though, to what was going on in the medieval church, there was what, what scholars have come to call as a, a Catholic Reformation going on well before uh, Luther came along. Mm. Various attempts to, to address the issues and problems that people have been criticizing for a couple of hundred years. And there were different streams of this, different approaches, but each of them having some success, but some some limita some limitations as well. So there were definitely currents of of, of movement uh, of reform endeavors uh, within that within the church before Luther came along and and, and the, the Protestant Reformation developed. Uh, when the Protestant Reformation developed, initially it seemed like most of the leadership in the Roman Church was basically reacting against it, uh, and, and, and uh, that, that's what gives some credibility, you know, g gives good credibility to talking about the, the Counter-Reformation, because it's seen as, as a movement to counter mm. what the Protestants had done. Um, but in, in due course, more than just opposing the, re the Reformers, what ended up happening is that uh, the concerns the Reformers had emphasized the answers they had given began to resonate also with people in the Roman leadership, and there did turn out to be some genuine changes uh, that that happened. Um, 
the, the founding of the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus, uh, became a, a major player in the in the endeavors of, of the Roman Church to straighten itself out, and they they became especially known for setting up very good schools, uh, some of the best in in all of Europe. Hmm. Um, that and you, then you finally had as well a, a reform-minded papacy that came along with Paul the Third and Paul the Fourth in the 1550s, um, uh, 1530s to 1550s. The, these men were determined not to become Protestants, not at all. They were they were strictly, vigorously medieval Catholics, but they were going to clean up the corruption. Mm. They were going to see to better education of priests. They were going to get rid of the, some of the things that were legitimately complained about in Rome. And what what ended up happening is that the city of Rome went within just a few years from being kind of a cesspool of every kind of, you know, thing going on that could be, because after all, it was the only international body center there was mm. in all Europe. Um, but it, it became pretty clean. It became almost sterile uh, in the way in which these things were clean, taken care of. Um, the equivalent of the mafia just disappeared at the behest of the, of the, of the Pope's soldiers. Um, prostitution was outlawed, uh, and, and, and brothels became convents. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, by the order of the papacy, that's either that or face your face life on the streets. So all kinds of rather dramatic and extraordinary things were done within Rome itself mm. to try to clean up its act. But then also at the, at the Council of Trent, there was a vigorous endeavor to try to nail down uh, what it is the church should be doing and teaching and practicing, mm. uh, often by opposition to the Protestants, but not always. And so there was a requirement, for example, that bishops, the, the leading figure in 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 in, a, in an urban situation or or over a large area, territory of land, would have to set up schools that would actually train priests. It's it's hard for us to perhaps to imagine, but during the Middle Ages there was no training required of priests other than the bit than to be able to read Latin. Mm. Uh, they didn't have to go to university. They didn't necessarily have to go to seminary, as we would think of that. And uh, what ended up taking place is that through the Council of Trent, it became a requirement that every bishop had to set up his seminary uh, where tr people would be trained not only in the faith, but also in morals and ethics and, and to read Latin and so on. Yeah. And there were 350 uh, of the bishoprics were in Italy itself. That made for a huge transformation of Italian society. And then the other 350 plus uh, th scattered throughout the rest of Western Europe also ended up uh, establishing and leading to a much better informed, even if non-Protestant uh, or even anti-Protestant uh, leadership. Mm. So it, it made for quite a difference. So f for those of us that think of the uh, so-called Counter-Reformation, uh, mm -hmm. which in essence might be the, the small and minor events that brought forth the Council of Trent, Right, uh, it views Trent as almost exclusively a response to uh, the reformers. You're saying that's just too simplistic of a view. That there is there was surely more going on even within the the Roman Catholic Church that brought forth the need uh, for reformation. And um, and you know, we could look at numerous different instances where reform uh, w was brought about that was not a direct response uh, to the reformers. So th there was there was surely more going on there when we investigate history. Is that right? The, that's right. There was there was a lot going on, and and met much of this fed into the Council of Trent, and didn't have anything directly to do with Protestants as much as it was an attempt to address the concerns that had been raised for two hundred years already throughout Europe, mm. uh, and in many ways they were trying to to deal with those as well. But for certain, the Protestant Reformation did provoke the kind of vigorous response that, that you find in the Counter-Reformation of the Council of Trent. Yep. I read through it um, many years ago and found out that I was anathematized, condemned to hell over 268 times, <laughs> from the various perspectives I held. Um, but, I mean, so certainly there's a vigorous counter, uh, movement against Protestantism. Yes. But it's, it's more to it than that. Uh, there's more going on. and They're trying to nail down and be more explicit about the, the, the faith as, as embraced by the Roman Church. Right, yeah, and, and in our pursuit of truth here, um, we shouldn't be mistaken to be, you know, Catholic sympathizers here. Uh, we're just trying to find out what really happened and, uh, you know, where are some good things where good things can be credited and where are some bad things where bad things can be credited. 
And so uh, it's always best to have the truth on your side. Uh, you can understand the issues and be a uh, more well-informed individual. Uh, so lest anyone think all of a sudden that we are uh, Trent uh, uh, affirmers. <laughs> so, okay. Um, my, this is my last prepared question for you. Uh, in what ways do you think the Reformation has been, as you've used these uh, two terms, a triumph and also a tragedy? Okay. I see the Reformation as a triumph in the sense that it helped to make clear again what the apostolic message was all about. Uh, the the teaching of the apostles as enshrined in Scripture also, uh, this joyful proclamation of peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and as over against the confusion that had developed in the Middle Ages, just with well-meant things getting in the way, cluttering up, being piled on top of that message such that even somebody as diligently searching, excuse me, as Martin Luther couldn't find it, uh, the, the Reformation was able to refocus the church and on, on what the message in Christ was, was focused on uh, and, and what, what the apostolic teaching was about. So it was a real triumph because the, the gospel, again, was made clear and the, the rationale for service of the Lord and, and, and worshiping him and living before him and being genuine disciples, not out of fear, but out of faith and, and hope and confidence and assurance uh, all of this sort of thing became became open and, and available and, and proclaimed again, mm. and so in that regard, it, it's it's there's a real triumph of the Reformation. Um, there's a tragedy on the side of the Reformation as well, though. In this sense, the reformers, in the midst of recognizing what the ref, what the faith was about and and coming to so much commonality also found ways of arguing with each other. They didn't just argue with Rome, with, with the various strands of Roman teaching, but they argued with each other. And of all things, the the initial basic controversy was was about the Lord's Supper, mm. the difference between Luther and Swingley on, 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 on understanding the Lord's Supper. And since the, the Supper, the, the Eucharist, the, the communion meal, is to be the, the bond of unity, uh, of all things, for that to be the point of conflict and, and, and disagreement, a disagreement that continued and has continued down to the present day. There have been attempts to heal it, but the, the perspectives that Lutherans and, and Reformed and others have on the Lord's Supper uh, were, were became dramatic during the 1520s, and this just played right nicely into the hands of defenders of the Roman Catholic Church. Because the, they said, you guys can't even get it straight on, 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 on the on, on on the sacrament of unity, mm. but but that that tension, that readiness to disparage each other, to depart from each other, has has bred a a pattern in, in Protestantism mm. that we've continued to divide and split from each other. Yeah, usually condemning the other as wrong, and and what what's ended up happening is that by the year two thousand nine, according to the International Bulletin of Missionary Research, there are thirty four thousand Protestant denominations. Mm. Thirty-four thousand, not congregations, denominations. And when you, when we take that and compare it to what Christ prays for in John 17, in John 17 verses 20 and 21, where he's praying, he's prayed for the disciples who will proclaim him. And he, then he goes on and he says, I pray for those who will believe in me through their word, which would include the church down through the ages. Yeah. I pray that those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, Father, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Mm. Which, in the way Christ argued it, is at least offers an excuse to the world not to believe if we're not one. Now, would I say that he meant that? No. But what he said is clearly he wants his church to be one. And for the, ch for the, for the church, the Protestant movement to be in 34,000 Protestant denominations, and who knows how many more have come along in the last eight years, uh, is is a tragedy because that obscures what the gospel is about. Mm. The the real evidence of that came on the mission field uh, in the early eighteen in the early eighteen hundreds when missionaries from Baptist and Anglican and Lutheran and Reformed and Presbyterian and other groups were in India and China and and, and the Philippines or wherever, and the poor people who were hearing this were saying, "Well, is Jesus Presbyterian or is he Lutheran? Is he you know?" And this. It, it, it became an obstacle so much that William Carey, a, a Baptist ministry, minister, uh, missionary in 1806, mm -hmm. 
back uh, a, a famous letter to the churches in England and asked, find a way to work together so that we're not in conflict with each other, in competition with each other. Mm. Um, and so the, the, the missionary endeavors of the church were frustrated. They were made more, much more difficult by the, the tragedy of our you know, multiplied splits against each other. Mm. So it, it, reminds, it reminds me as well of, of what, the, um, what the early church, the very early church leader said, Clement of Rome, who, who wrote in 95 AD or so, a letter to the, from the Romans to the Corinthians. Uh, this Clement may have been Paul's co-worker in Philippians 4.3. That's certainly what the early church understood him to be. And he writes to him, he says, be contentious and zealous, but only about the things that relate to salvation. Mm. In, in chapter 45, verse 1, uh, there's no way there are 34,000 different things that relate to salvation that have split us. <laughs> uh, and so this is not a, a new concern as much as it's one that we've we brought on ourselves. Right, right. And, you know, I imagine many of those 34,000 could be... Uh, grouped and categorized into broader sure. tents, but, but nonetheless, the principle applies here that now anyone can go off and start their own church. Uh, and, Seems like. Right, and that's definitely a, a tragedy. Uh, you know, I also think in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about there being unity among the people. Um, so it is, it is one of the shortcomings uh, of, the, uh, of the Reformation. But so, what would you say about, um, say, evangelical free churches, or, or, or you know, churches that are more broadly evangelical? Um, so, my, my church denomination is more broadly evangelical. Doesn't it have as uh, it doesn't major on the minor issues? Uh, what do mm -hmm. you think of churches like that that are trying to bring in a broader um, net of, of people with varying beliefs on those minor issues? I, I, th I think that's a, that's one of the ways of, of trying to address this and to to have a living embodiment in a local area uh, of people from who embrace embrace Christ by faith, but who may have some difference of perspective. Mm. I mean, as I've often said, uh, if we're brothers and sisters in Christ, we're family, and as we all know, families have differences of opinion, but they're still family. Um, so I think that's one of the ways of doing it. I think another thing that's to be be recognized and respected is the endeavors in in ecumenical movements mm. to try to bring to try to overcome long-standing disagreements, not to build some one organizational body that will arise from ecumenical endeavors. That's 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 nobody's dream. Yeah. Uh, but to find ways of working together and respecting each other in the midst of recognizing the differences that that still keep us in separate bodies, but to affirm the ways in which we can embrace each other as brothers and sisters in Christ mm. and make that manifest on local level so that people can see that, prod that that people who are evangelical free or Presbyterian or Reformed or Baptist or Methodist or whatever uh, can all interact together and, and work for, for common causes. Yeah, and I know you, you've you done some uh, work as well uh, in uh, reaching out to uh, e Eastern Orthodox uh, folks, mm -hmm. and uh, you've also written this book, Light from the Christian East, which I also had here. I grabbed that at the break. And the reason why I grabbed it to also mention this, uh, it's an introduction to the Orthodox tradition, is because uh, Blaine uh, bowed in here. His question, uh, assuming he's been anxiously awaiting here, his question is, I'd like to hear Jim's thoughts on how the East, or, or Orthodox East post-schism he, he describes, on how that um, relates to the discussion on the Reformation. So what are your thoughts about, um, I guess, Reformation-era relationships or responses of the East? Okay, uh, it's fascinating uh, to look at that situation. By the time the Reformation came along, all the Orthodox churches uh, had been swallowed up by Muslim states, except for the, 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 the Orthodox Church in Russia. And Russia re remained pretty much unknown, an unknown commodity for, uh, for Europeans for a long period of time. Um, the, the Orthodox Church had had its own history of development. It didn't have, it didn't have the focus on on law and legal standing with God mm. that had become the common pattern in, in the medieval period in the West. And so the the idea of justification being, you know, in God's uh, having a, a standing in God, before God and before the final judgment, uh, as it were, um, that wasn't the way in which they focused on the question. So, as the way I put it, sometimes is that. The Eastern Orthodox didn't itch where the Reformation wanted to scratch. Uh, 
the things they were dealing with were looking at were not things that the Reformation spoke to as such. Mm-hmm. The Reformation spoke to a particular context in the West, which had developed. But in the East, it had developed in a different fashion. And so the, it, uh, the, there were endeavors on the part of Luther and on the part of Reformed to try to make some contact with, with leadership in, in, in Constantinople especially, mm. uh, because the, that had been the, the ecumenical patriarch, the kind of first among equals of Orthodox leaders. Uh, but the endeavors to try to, to enlist the Orthodox to be also anti, anti-Rome or anti-Catholic, but to get them and, and the Lutherans or the other Protestants to agree – Together, it, it didn't go anywhere. The by, by and large, the, the leadership in, Pen- in, in Constantinople uh, backed away from that because they recognized this this wasn't something that fit with who they were and the kind of things they emphasized. Mm. Um, so that it, it's it's a fascinating it's a fascinating area of question. It's one that I've had interest in, as you indicated, by the book I wrote and also in teaching about Eastern European history. Mm. Uh, but but the Reformation has not had uh, had an impact by and large. Uh, in in uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy, because it it speaks to questions that Orthodoxy doesn't it, they're, they're not front and center for Orthodoxy. Their their questions are different. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. All right, before I let you go, tell me uh, what are some things that are on the horizon for you? Writing projects that you might be working on or or interested to uh, get around to in the future. Okay. Uh, what I'm working on right now, trying to finish up, is, is a book contract I have with the publisher of the two books you've shown, uh, with InterVarsity Press, uh, and it's called The Victory of the Cross, Orthodoxy on Salvation. It was suggested by a, an Orthodox uh, friend who is a systematic theologian, and he suggested that with my with my uh, sense of, or, of how Orthodoxy operates and thinks, uh, if I would do a, a work on the victory on the cross, uh, victory of the cross, Orthodoxy on Salvation, uh, and tried to make it accessible to Western Christian readers too, as as I tried to do it in, in that more introductory work, Light from the Christian East. That would be a service to both groups uh, in Christianity. So I'm I'm working on that now. It's going well, and I'm drawing a lot more on the on the Church Fathers and the liturg- the rich liturgical traditions of the of the of the Christian East uh, to do that. So I'm I'm really enjoying that. Uh, once that's done, I'd like to get back to work on the um, uh, that's really taken my attention the last few years on on the Church Fathers. Mm. Uh, the earliest church fathers. I'm, I'm trying to discern how to, to identify how the the concern the apostles had for the continuity in the faith ended up fleshing itself out or be, be, being carried forward, uh, and, and to try to trace the steps in that development down to uh, down to the early fourth century when it when we end up eventually with the Nicene Ni- the Creed of Nicaea. Mm. But I, I found some interesting things there uh, because it's often it said, well, you know, we, we it's it's with the apostolic preaching. Well, of course, it's the apostolic preaching, but how is that passed on? Mm. Uh, it's quite a while before the Bible, the New Testament as we know it, is codified and is collected together right. everywhere. So, how how was that done? And so that's what I'm trying to trying to discern in that book, trying to lay out in that book. Nice. And then another one uh, that I'd like to do after that is is has a provocative title, uh, the problem of Augustine. Mm. Uh, Recognizing all the wonderful things that Augustine brought, Saint Augustine of Hippo brought uh, uh, to, to the the ancient church, also that he he manifested a confidence in in human reason, uh, human reason's ability to decipher God's ways and to figure out the things that earlier church fathers had said. Look, that's in God's hands. We can't possibly understand that. Mm. Um, the reason for doing that is not just to criticize Augustine, but to say that that confidence. Uh, has spread into Western Christian teaching such that we do end up with all these arguments. So let, let me just toss this out. 34,000 Protestant Christian Protestant denominations. Yeah. The Orthodox have not had any doctrinal controversies that led them to schism. Mm. And they've been around, chasing themselves all the way back. Yeah. There's something different going on there, and I just want to try to help identify that. I don't mean to by by saying they haven't had any either to, to, to dismiss what happened with the the Oriental Orthodox churches, but as the leaders of the Oriental Orthodox churches and the Orthodox churches of the Eastern Orthodox churches have said, what really was at issue back when these two groups split from each other was more determination to be out of the Byzantine Empire than any real genuine definite doctrinal differences. Mm. So it, it's quite a difference, and and I think that to a significant degree. 
Augustine's confidence in human reason uh, to lay things out um, has done away with too much of the mystery that the Eastern Church continues to say with the with the ancient fathers is simply part of what it means to be a Christian. Okay, wow. So that's sounds like you, you're you're doing some good work and good research. And uh, please, I'm sure we'll stay in touch. And uh, you know, once those books come out, we'll we'll bring you back on the show to to talk about where your research has led you. So okay, that, that'd be fun. I would enjoy it. And thank, thanks. This has been a good opportunity. I've appreciated it. Appreciated it. No, thank you. Thanks, Jim. And, uh, you know, I, I know before we started the, the interview formally here, you mentioned that you're kind of finalizing up your, your interviews and public speaking on this topic. So let me thank you for allowing us that great honor uh, to conclude uh, the, the, this, uh, that season of your research. Uh, so thanks so much. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Of course. God bless you. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye. All right. So I hope that you enjoyed that uh, that conversation uh, an enlightening one i think where you know we've had thoughts about the reformation and uh how maybe they've just been a bit too simplistic and uh, when we investigate and we go into history and we seek out the truth we find that uh, the truth is um in in some ways it's a little bit more more muddy um but uh you know we as long as we seek out that truth we're going to come out um better uh more well-rounded individuals and we're going to have a, a right frame of mind and um, just representing and speaking the truth in and of itself is, is a good and so we need to be accurate even in how we understand our own history and how we understand the history of those with whom we disagree uh, so that we we might not falsely accuse them uh, which also think of that too as one of the ten commandments that we not make false uh, accusations so Really, a, a great conversation about the Reformation. Um, I know it probably would have been nicer to have this topic a little bit earlier, but I know um, Jim was around speaking, even spoke at our uh, Defenders Conference, and so we finally got a chance to bring him on the podcast formally here to talk about these issues. So that does it for the show today. I'm uh, grateful for the continued support of our patrons. Again, those are people that just chip in $10, $20 a month. And again, if you'd like to get this USB flash drive, we'd love to get your monthly support the flash drive comes preloaded with some of our favorite episodes uh, over the past year. We've been doing this uh, over a year now. I'd love to get your support at $20 a month uh, to help this program uh, grow to reach more people. I'm also grateful for the partnerships that we have with our sponsors, Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, Evolution 2.0, Fox Restoration, and Nonprofit Megaphone. Thank you to our technical producer, Chris, and to our guest today, Dr. Jim Payton. He's the author of Getting the Reformation Wrong, and we'll be sure to provide a link to that book on uh, our website. If you click on uh, today's episode, uh, we'll have a link there so you can check out that book. And uh, also, we will get in touch with the winner of the giveaway. I saw we had a number of, of people that shared it, so we will randomly select someone and get in touch with them. Uh, and last but not least, out of all those that I am thankful to, I am thankful for you. Uh, for your desire to strive for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.